Text, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Tribal Connections Roundtable, Developing Land Acknowledgements. Hello, and thank you for joining us. My name is Jennifer Hill, and I'm a biologist at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's National Conservation Training Center. Prior to introducing our guest speakers, I would like to highlight that in keeping with the mission of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to protect habitats and connect people with nature, the National Conservation Training Center acknowledges that it sits on the ancestral lands of many Native nations. River and trees. Several indigenous people stewarded these lands near Shepherdstown, West Virginia, or traversed this area during forceful removal. These include, but are not limited to, the Iroquois Confederacy, the Shawnee, and the Delaware. However, the Massawamak Nation was the most prominent of the people in this area. As we have learned more about the indigenous peoples who had relationships with these lands before us, we better appreciate the soil on which we work, live, and learn. And for this, we give our deepest thanks to the ones that came before. We encourage others to learn more about the land on which they work and reside, as it is on these lands that we are able to connect the continuing education of service employees and our partners. At any time during the presentation, should you have questions, please enter them into the chat or email them to broadcast at fws.gov. Today, we are going to hear about developing land acknowledgements from Crystal Leonetti and Melissa Shaganoff. First off, we'll hear about Crystal, who will then introduce Melissa. Crystal Leonetti. Alaska has been home to Crystal and her family for many generations. On her mother's side in the Bristol Bay region with Yupik ancestry, and on her father's side as homesteaders coming from Texas in the 1940s. She grew up on a small farm with her parents and three siblings. Crystal went to college at the University of Idaho, hoping to become a high school teacher. She earned her Bachelor of Science degree in Ag Agricultural Education in 2000 and returned to Alaska to pursue a natural resources career at the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Natural Resources Conservation Service, a federal agency that helps private landowners apply conservation practices on their land. In August of 2010, Crystal began her job at the United States Fish and Wildlife Service as the Alaska Native Affairs Specialist. In her capacity there, she represents the regional director in Alaska Native Interests and coordinates and trains employees on the regional government-to-government -government relations with Alaska's federally recognized tribes. Thank you, Crystal, for joining us today. I'll now hand it over to you to introduce Melissa. Crystal Leonetti smiles from a home living room. Ah, uh, geez, cook. I said in my Yupik language, what's up? My name is Jiskuk. My Yupik name was given to me in the traditional way by my grandparents, Daisy, and the late Harry Barnes Sr. from Chugayung, Alaska. I'm coming to you today from Dagayakak, translated into English as Mouth of the Needlefish. Dagayakak is now known as Anchorage, Alaska. Danaina Ethnena. These are the traditional homelands and unceded territory of the Dena'ina people. My husband, Ed, and I feel honored to raise our family here in this beautiful place, which has been stewarded by the Dena'ina people for a very long time before outsiders arrived. The Dena'ina people have lived here in times of abundance, times of shortage, times of war, and times of love. Their bones, are in the soil. To this day, Dena'ina people are leaders and remain stewards of the beautiful land. I'm thankful for their leadership past, present, and future. I'm really excited and honored to be with you today. Thank you to Jennifer Hill and the National Conservation Training Center for offering the Tribal Broadcast Series. I think they deserve a high 25, <laughs> if that's possible. 
Now I have the pleasure of introducing you to someone really special. She does it all, and she does it with grace and love. Melissa Shaganoff is part of the Udishu, or Caribou, and Koyutakata, or Fish Eater clans, from Nyeetdini Anna, or Chickaloon Village, Alaska. She is Atna and Paiute, an artist, a social activist, and the curator of Alaska Pacific University's art galleries. Her work is shaped by the structure and processes of the Diné ceremonies of potlatch. She has been published in the Alaska Humanities Forum magazine, First American Art magazine, Inuit Art Quarterly, and the Smithsonian Arctic Studies Center Learning Lab. She teaches about land acknowledgement concepts and other indigenous leadership attributes. So with that, Melissa, take it away. Shag enough with small kitchen behind her. Uh, Shanann, uh, Willie Jan, and Zarote, Melissa Shagnos is at the land. I did she ask Koykara at land. I eat in Anna Hayak Sensiaden. Shanann, so much, Crystal, um, for bringing me into this work. Um, this last year, I've done a few different trainings and workshops on land acknowledgement uh, with the Fish and Wildlife Service. And you know, considering its history in Alaska, it's it's really important to me um, and important uh, to be in communication and relationship, um, you know, with, with an agency that uh, has worked with indigenous people in, in many capacities. Um, so I'm, I'm just really honored to be here today to share sort of my thoughts on it and, and talk about how we can, you know, move forward. Um, because many of our institutions, including, you know, agencies such as Fish and Wildlife Service, um, have many levels of colonialism, you know, within, within its uh, systemic sort of structures. So it's important to address these things now um, and recognize where we're starting and what we can do in the future. So I just want to say Chanan again for having me, having me here. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and share the presentation and we'll, we'll get going. Text with flower on branch, you are on indigenous land. All right. So you are on indigenous land. Everywhere in North America um, is an indigenous place. And it's been stewarded for thousands of years by indigenous people. And recognizing that is, is, is a way that we can start um, countering sort of colonial falsehoods of the wild and frontier. And specifically in Alaska, that's, that's what I've experienced is, is kind of this sort of false narrative that this place, um, you know, was this new place when uh, at contact with uh, non-native people. Um, but the truth is, it's always been indigenous place and it's always been touched and cared for and stewarded, um, you know, but we're going to get a little bit more into that. Um, so it's part of the structure. So I have a little intro, let me move it, intro slide. This is me. <laughs> this is where I'm from, um, from Night Dinyana uh, or Chickaloon Village, um, what we call the log over the river. Um, this is going up the road that I took just a couple days ago, going to hide camp um, to work on some moose hides with my aunties. Uh, so this is around Eureka area. So in Atna territory, just a little bit north. Um, this is also my contact information. If you'd like to take a screenshot or write it down. Uh, yeah, I'll keep going. Who are you? Where are you from? So if you could in the chat um, to be able to share it with each other you know, later, uh, I'd like you to introduce yourself. And, you know, hopefully this will be something that I'll be able to see later. Um, you know, part of land acknowledgement, I think, is is kind of introducing who you are and your intentions. And growing up, you know, that was the first thing I learned, that if you're going to learn your language, the first thing you need to learn is how to introduce yourself, you know, how to set the set the sort of stage and, and kind of let people know where you're coming from and who you're responsible towards. So yeah, if, if these are a few questions that you wouldn't mind putting into the chat um, and hopefully we'll be able to see that with each other uh, at a later time, but who you are, where you're from and what you do, and do you know whose indigenous land you're on? 
All right, so we'll keep going. Photos of three women. Um, you know, I want to recognize kind of who brought me here. Um, that's another really important part of my culture, and and I would say, you know, you know, pretty much across Alaska, a really important part of all Indigenous cultures, you know, is that it recognizing your teachers and who brought you there. So I want to say Chanan Sagu to uh, my teachers, uh, Sonia Kelleher Combs and Emily Johnson. Um, who are two artists who taught me a lot about what does it mean um, to be an indigenous culture bearer and artist and and the sort of weight that that holds, um, but also the possibilities. You know, um, growing up, I, I didn't really have um, role models like that, you know, and they really kind of took me under their wing and showed me you know, what an artistic Indigenous life can be. And uh, I just really appreciate them for that. Um, they're also two amazing artists, if you look them up, Emily Johnson and Sonia Kelleher Combs. I also want to recognize Jeannie Maxim, um, who is my elder, um, who's been teaching my language and, you know, through recording, still teaching me. Um, she passed away this last year. And, uh, you know, I just really want to recognize her, particularly whenever I use my language. So Chinansa Gu to them. Now uh, we'll go to our first question. And this is another one that we'll um, address in the chat after, which is what does land acknowledgement actually acknowledge? So the structure of this workshop, um, I created it during when I was a, a museum curator. And it was really kind of out of this desire to really see land acknowledgements become more commonplace um, in Alaska. And I uh, this happened because I had gone to a conference in Canada and, you know, part of their truth and reconciliation policy, government policy is to do land acknowledgements, you know, and uh, I didn't realize at that conference how much it would it would mean to me um, hearing a land acknowledgement over and over again. And uh, it 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 made me sort of like see kind of the, the potential land acknowledgements can have for your audience. But then also I, it kind of made me be a bit more critical as to what they're actually doing, right? Because land acknowledgement is just words, right? And so it's like, how do we use land acknowledgement as a way to sort of strategize our personal reparations and our institutional reparations? How are we, how are we offering healing and equity in land acknowledgement? Um, did folks, I, yeah, I, I'm not seeing that in there, Jen. So I don't know if I have um, access to seeing where people are are from, but uh, but I know that after the fact we talked about being able to see that. But yeah, if anybody would would go ahead and type where they're from and uh, what they do and if they've ever heard a land acknowledgement before, um, that would be great. I know it's a lot to transfer, um, but uh, yeah, yes, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, but we'll go ahead and keep going. Um, this this sort of this sort of word, I think, uh, this sort of question, I think, is something that we can we'll revisit towards the end. Um, you know, uh, yeah, a lot of the teaching that I do and, and the reason why I do this workshop is because it's it's really about sort of your personal um, personal work to be done. You know, uh, I think that you know I could sit here and tell you like what land acknowledgement is and sort of the breakdown of the one one, and I will. But I also think that it's important to kind of do some self-reflection and ask yourself questions. So even if I can't see your answers, I think it's a really important thing just to ask yourself these things. Um, because as you start to ask yourself those questions, interrogate your own sort of beliefs and knowledge, um, you're going to be able to start seeing where the holes are and what kind of work you need to be doing forward. But yeah, we'll keep we'll keep going. Uh, so the first little bit of content I have is a video, and it's just a short video, but it was created by the U.S. Department of Arts and Cultures, and I think it's like a really great, um, a really great way to start kind of like your land acknowledgement work and, and journey, essentially, because uh, it shouldn't stop with just your statement. Before I begin this morning, I'd like to recognize the Algonquin Nation, on whose traditional territory we are gathering. We acknowledge them as the past, present, and future caretakers of this land. Text, in countries such as Canada, New Zealand and Australia, it is commonplace, even policy, to open events and gatherings by acknowledging the traditional indigenous inhabitants of that land, Warren Gus Yellowhair. Wherever I go on God's green earth, I do the Lakota tradition of acknowledging the four directions, the land, and the people living there. 
Uchimaka, as I call Grandmother Earth, the land, I view her as a, a sacred, you know, living entity. And that's the way we acknowledge it in, you know, Lakota thought and philosophy. As a Native person, I'm ready for any kind of confrontation that might come up, or I'm preparing myself to remind people of all those things that they forget about. I was at a meeting in Minneapolis, and the room was primarily non-Native people. I was in a non-Native organization, but this executive director got up and said, okay, we're gonna get started. So everybody you know, was sitting down and getting quiet. And she said, I'd like to get started by acknowledging the indigenous culture of this, of Minnesota. And I was like, first, I was like, wow. And it just made everything like fall away a little bit for me. My guard went down, I was more relaxed. Because by saying that, like, that means she understands something that is just like, you can't talk about, right? There's just, it just relaxed me as a minority, as a woman and as a native person, like it just, like, like pulled away this layer that's always there, you know. It was super cool. Ron Martinez. We're at a, we're at a time where um, non-native cultures are understanding the traditions of indigenous peoples for for probably the first time in our histories. So, like when I go to New Zealand, the protocol is to acknowledge each other's ancestors and your mountains and your rivers, and 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 that's such a beautiful tradition. When people are in that space and say, we acknowledge who you are, this land, the, where your people come from, they're saying, we acknowledge a relationship, but we're also creating that relationship. So this is a good thing. Poor year. The important thing would be that folks would then sit with that. Like, what does it mean that our settlement is occupying this space? And what responsibility do I have considering that legacy to these contemporary things, right? And how do I stop distancing myself from that? Ideally, that would be, for me, the impact that this has. If you start acknowledging that the land that you're standing on and the space that you are in belong to people that are still here, like, make so much more room for understanding of all these other issues. It's one of those little things that, like, if it could just tip a little bit, all the, like, dominoes that could fall from it. I think are important. Laurie Poirier wanders her eyes back and forth. Now I'm like imagining it and like wanting to live in that like <laughs> the thing that I'm imagining like yeah that's actually really beautiful. It's just being a genuine human being to acknowledge each other's histories, um, the good and the bad. Text, we call on all individuals and organizations to open public events and gatherings with acknowledgement of the traditional native inhabitants of the land. Together we can spark a movement to spread this practice, moving toward full truth and reconciliation. Learn more and learn how. www.usdac.us slash native land. Credits, video, Nicholas Ward, Brian D. Parker. Editing, Nicholas Ward. Music, Cloud Mouth, Poddington Bear. Hashtag honor native land usdac.us um, so yeah so I, I like to let that whole sort of the credits run through because i really want to recognize this organization um there it's a really uh, a really wonderful sort of um organizing agency and arts agency that does uh, a lot of guides and a lot of teaching sort of moments and it's really where i started kind of like learning about land acknowledgements and how i could you know teach them in alaska um the guide uh, honoring native land, which is on their website, is a really wonderful start. Um, I will say it doesn't sort of follow or doesn't doesn't address the North and Alaska. Um, you know, when we look at sort of federally recognized tribes, you know, 530 or so are in the state or, or all together in the whole country, and then over over half of them, like 239 or something, are in Alaska. You know, and uh, and that's a, a really important sort of, um, you know, cultures to be addressed and included in those kind of things. So I created my own guide. <laughs> um, so uh, if you look on my website, you can find a guide that also has all the clickable links to things that I learned. Um, so I'll make sure that uh, that that's given to Crystal and can be shared with people who who need. Um, yeah, thank thank you so much, Doug, for um, putting in the info, info into the chat. I've, I've catched a few of people introductions and I appreciate that. 
Um, but yeah, we're going to go into kind of what land acknowledgement is um, and kind of the, the sort of structure. Land acknowledgement. So what is land acknowledgement? You know, uh, this is the question I was asked when I started doing this work, you know, a lot, right? Um, because I think that in some ways, land acknowledgement can be really over intellectualized, you know, that it can sort of think, oh, well, we have, it's about being grateful, but then it's about, you know, being grateful to everybody and all these things. And, and I was like, okay, I, I can understand where you're going with that. But, but at the same time, first and foremost, land acknowledgement is about recognizing indigenous people, recognizing indigenous people in their stewardship, in their work and their history, you know, um, you know, and considering the, the history of the world and the history of these places, you know, in, in Alaska, you know, our oldest, you know, just according to archaeological record, you know, old, oldest sort of site, you know, of Diné people, you know, I believe they're called ancient Beringians, but um, in the anthropological sense, but truly Diné people, <laughs> Athabascan people, you know, is 17,000 years old. And, and that's when you look at the timeline of the world, I, I'm sure I don't have to tell anybody here, you know, that's before the pyramids, that's before any sort of form of written language. That's a really, the things that we consider ancient in our history of sort of Western civilization, um, that's a really ancient thing. Uh, and and it's truly sort of uh, a history that that is about stewardship and relationship with this place um, and really uh, the only sustainable culture that has been here within Alaska. So um, yeah, I think that in some ways land acknowledgement is a moment for you to, to counter those sort of narratives um, that erase us from the history, right? Uh, I, I call it counting, countering, you know, col colonial falsehoods, um, particularly ones that perpetuate the, the Western romanticism of land and, and, and wild, you know? Um, for those of you in Alaska and, you know, uh, you know, others, we hear Alaska as being the last frontier, right? This great wild, untouched place. And those are truly just false narratives. They're they're just a fallacy because um, there's nothing, there's no part of of Alaska that is able to be defined as a frontier. You know, frontier, you know, is 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 erases indigenous stewardship and indigenous work and and you know the interaction that we've had with this place for so long, you know, and uh, it's really important for for us to use things like land acknowledgements to sort of counter those those arguments, right? And and I like to call it, um, you know, sharing the sort of burden of truth. You know, I think that I, me being here and my power and privilege and, and sharing these things with you, you know, is, is kind of like me offering it to you and asking you to continue that sort of, his, that sort of sharing, right? Because then it's not no it's no longer just on my shoulders. It's no longer just on Crystal's shoulders, right? And for <laughs> so for so for so long since contact, it's always been on Indigenous shoulders to talk the truth about things, to to speak the truth about this place, because we we're just constantly erased from our own land, you know. And uh, it's it's really important to sort of um, I think use land acknowledgement as a moment to share that history. Um, and, and in allyship, you know, uh, share some of this burden of truth, you know? Um, yeah. So, uh, I also think land acknowledgement is a way to kind of open a space, um, you know, open a space, open a station with your intentions, which is about hopefully, you know, in this day, this day and age about equity and about bringing everybody in and about having sort of collective decision-making, you know, um, on land, on, on all these things. And uh, land acknowledgements can be a good way to sort of open the door. You know, I, I spoke, and, and much like the um, speaker in the video, Mary Bardot, talked about going to a conference, like I went to a conference and hearing the, the sort of director stand up and give a land acknowledgement, you know, how that kind of made everything fall away for her. And, and, and that's the same, was the same sort of experience I had. I sort of let, let out this sort of breath of air that I was, uh, uh, this breath of air that I was, or this, this breath I was holding in and just kind of like let it go because, you know, all the things that I was holding kind of like on my shoulders as being, you know, at least coded the only indigenous person that I recognized and feeling like the only indigenous person in that room. I thought, you know, maybe that person, maybe that executive director, that leader 
considers me in the work that they do, considers my family in the work that they do, you know, and of course it wasn't action. It wasn't, uh, you know, really the proof, <laughs> you know, of that, that that person thought those things. Um, but it opened a door for me to feel more comfortable in that space and also emboldened me, you know, to really kind of look at that work as this is something that I can be doing. This is something that I can be changing and emboldened me to ask questions of that person and to and to essentially start a relationship with them where there was no relationship before, you know, and uh, I'm, <laughs> it's funny that I say that because I, I, I'm going to be doing a residency there in that in that organization because of that really that relationship that started that time, you know, um, land acknowledgement is also an opportunity to share information about the sustainable technologies um, of indigenous people. You know, I think that uh, when we hear technology, we think of it, you know, as really kind of like the future. Um, but I think in, in, in many ways we need to look, we need to remember forward, you know, remember um, the past and the way indigenous people have managed the land. You know, and I know that many um, uh, stations in the, in the Fish and Wildlife Service does this, but I think that we have to continue to remind ourselves to do this and continue to look at the way indigenous people have managed the land, have have relationships with the animals, have relationships with the waters and the fish, you know, as a technology, because it's truly a sustainable way. It's sustainable for for 17,000 years. I mean, how more sustainable do we want to get? <laughs> you know, and I think that uh, that if we just start giving power, you know, in those statements back to indigenous people, it opens the door for all of us and everyone listening to you um, to start thinking that way, you know, um, because those Western romanticism, you know, kind of falsehoods, they sort of make us believe that Alaska and these places that all of you work you know, were once these wild, untouched things and that Native people were either not there or were just kind of like living as amongst them as, as part of it, right? As part of the floral and fauna, but really they were there caring for it. And part of their belief was about being in relationship, not necessarily being above it, that they were within it, you know, and that they didn't own it. They were responsible for it and responsible towards it. Um, so. Yeah, and I also want to say too before we move on is that you know I, I'm kind of giving like a lot of a lot of uh, credit to land acknowledgement, but um, it is just a gesture. Land acknowledgement is just words. It's not reconciliation. It's not reparations. Land acknowledgement is just words. But I do think that if you're if you take a deeper look at the words, you take a deeper look as to why you want to be doing a land acknowledgement. Um, it can help you strategize what your path forward is. And, and how you're going to use your land acknowledgement um, to, to challenge yourself, you know, to always be learning. So, yeah, I, I saw some, some questions and stuff too. And, you know, I do this workshop, you know, quite a bit, um, you know, feel free to take a, a screenshot, uh, but I just ask that, you know, just, just as in land acknowledgement that you, you know, you credit sort of the work that I've done um, in that as well. So, yeah, feel, feel free to, to take a screenshot. Um, and then also a lot of this information is in the guide that I created on my website, which is just my name, melissashaganoff.com. And uh, if you go to the Land Acknowledgement Workshop, you'll see a, a button for PDF. So, all right, keep going. Map of Alaska with labeled native regions. Uh, uh, you know, also I want to say too that, that, that this work, this is just my work, you know. This is, I, I can't go and say that this is, um, that this is the exact right way to do it. This is just how I do land acknowledgement. And this is how I teach about land acknowledgement, you know, and I've talked to my elders, talked to my tribe and trying to do it the best way possible. But also I'm always changing and I'm always learning too, you know, and what's what's right today or feels good today um, might be challenged tomorrow, but that's part of it. Like if we're if we're working towards equity and change, it's an ongoing process and we're never arriving at the exact right land acknowledgement or the exact right answer. It's just about taking the next step forward and doing your best in that moment and then trying to take the next step and the next step and the next step. Um, it's just up to you to uh, to continue that that movement forward and continue to ask yourself questions. So uh, now I just want to share a little bit about um, about, you know, within Alaska and sort of the, the cultural things that I've learned that I think are in line with land acknowledgement. And 
you know, also some contextual things. You know, I think when you learn these things about indigenous cultures, indigenous belief systems, that it can help us sort of kind of bridge the gap and start a relationship with each other, start an allegiance with each other, you know, because I think ultimately our goals are our goals are similar. We want to live within this place. We want to care for it. Um, and sometimes that means giving it over to indigenous people. Sometimes that means, you know, handing over the power and privilege, you know, to indigenous people um, because we've been doing it for so long. You know, and and that doesn't mean necessarily like taking away something from from you or from your organization. It means about um, starting a, a cycle of reciprocity between the two, you know, and that's truly an indigenous way of being. It's about kind of giving away what you have um, with the hope that you'll get it back. And in indigenous ways, you will. Indigenous potlatch, indigenous ceremony, indigenous indigenous um, beliefs of morality, you'll get those things back, you know, kind of like karma, you know, um, to simplify it. But of course, uh, it, it, it involves much, you know, much more, you know, specific things talking specifically about Alaska. So um, yeah, I, I started off this uh, presentation saying, uh, which means I'm responsible for Chikulun village, I'm responsible for the log of the river, you know, and you know, I, I said when I was starting to learn my language, you know, introductions were the first thing I learned. Um, and I never really understood that, you know, uh, as a young person. But as I've gotten older, I realized that it's it's because you're you're kind of leading with like, you know, you're leading with um, who you're accountable towards. You know, you're leading with, you know, it, I'm I'm coming and uh, I'm going to come into this place and introduce myself. Um but you know what, Here, here's where I'm accountable towards, here's where I'm responsible for, you know, and, and part of my carefulness, part of my respect that I'm offering is because I hold that on my shoulders, you know, and I hold that with me. And I, I have to, I have to also honor that, you know, I think that we think so individually, um, you know, in, in the modern world that, you know, when we mess up, it's just our mess up, you know, but, um, the way way I was raised and how I believe is that uh, you know that your your the work that you do you're responsible not only just towards yourself you're responsible towards your whole community you bring that community with you and you're representing them so you need to be thinking um, what's the best way I can introduce myself what's the best way I can offer respect when I go into a place that's not my own um, you know and because it, it's a it's a culturally appropriate thing to know someone. And, you know, that was something that I learned um, from from my chief in Chickaloon, Gary Harrison. You know, um, I learned that when he was quite young, you know, in his early 20s, he became chief. And it's because he would drive up and down on a territory, you know, that deep red part in, in, the, in the map you see. Drive up and down that road, up and down. And he knew everybody's house, knew where he could stop to get some tea, knew where he could, what elder might need fish, knew where he could, you know, get his tire changed, um, you know, and and. Again, as a young person, I didn't understand why why that made him chief, like why that was so important. Um, but then I realized that it's 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 the importance of knowing people, because indigenous um, leadership, indigenous belief systems, you know, um, are really about being a good person. And you're a leader and considered a wealthy person if you have the ability ability to care for a lot of people. And, and that ability includes knowing what their needs are, you know, knowing what ways they can contribute to the community. And that knowledge is looked at as power. You know, it's looked at as, as, as being that good person. And if you're that good person, you know, honoring the natural role revolves around being grateful. If you're that good person who's being grateful, the animals, the plants, the waters, the fish, they're going to give themselves to you. They're going to offer in themselves to you because you're walking through the world in the best way possible, you know, and, and they know you, they know your soul. And if you're doing that kind of work, you're going to be gifted. And then that starts that cycle of reciprocity, that cycle of sharing, you know, you're being gifted. So you have to be a good person. And then you gift that to your community and then you're gifted again and you're a good person. And then you give that to your community. And, um, you know, I, I share this, you know, um, because I think that, it's a really good thing. Um, it's a really good thing to to try to hold on to. And um, 
also, you know, realize about indigenous people, realize about indigenous cultures, uh, you know, and I don't want to talk about talk to every indigenous culture. I can really only talk from my own. Um, but I will say that, you know, this is this is a belief that I've heard from, from many cultures, you know, that I'm in community with um, indigenous cultures. So I think it's just something to keep in mind, um, you know, and again, uh, again, these moments, too, that I'm sharing, you know, they're very um, special to me and uh, special to my to my um, culture. So I, I just want to you know, make sure, too, that whatever you share after this, that it's also credited to the Atna people and credit to myself. Um, sorry to keep reminding you, but at the same time, it's it's just important to offer protection for yourself as well, too. Um, and I, I think land acknowledgement also offers the opportunity, uh, you know, to learn these things, right? Because when you take a deeper dive and start interrogating your own beliefs and own knowledge of Indigenous people, of, in, of the Indigenous land that you're on, you know, uh, I think it connects you, you know, to both a global community and a local community you know, of indigenous, of indigenous people. So yeah, we'll keep going. Text, think about where you are. Do I know indigenous people? All right. So uh, this is kind of the big ask that I have for you all. Um, I want you to answer one of these three questions, um, you know, for yourself, but then also, you know, please put them in the chat and uh, hopefully we'll just get a couple of those questions. So Doug, you know, I'll just, you know, let you kind of choose whichever ones you, you're able to kind of put in there. Um, or get in time, um, and we'll read them later on in the in the presentation. But um, here's the questions, and this is also something I think good for you to hold on to. Uh, do I know who the indigenous people are in the place I live or work? Do I know the work they do to care for this place? What ways can I acknowledge them? What work will I do to make sure they see and or hear it? What barriers or fears do I have in reaching out, thanking them, or outwardly supporting them in actions of reparations? So take a look at these questions, um, think about them, just give just a few seconds more. Um, and if it, whoever feels uh, inclined, you know, please put it into the chat and, you know, whichever ones come in first, I'm sure Doug will just grab and, uh, and share later. So yeah, we're going to keep going. Young girl in a classroom setting. Um, we're going to go ahead and actually skip over this, this video. Uh, this is a, I'll just kind of go through what it is. It's, it's a, I just don't want to take up too much time with this, but um, yeah, this, this video is uh, uh, from the Toronto school system and um, you know, in schools every morning, they start with the land acknowledgement. They teach students how to do land acknowledgements. And I think like the big takeaway um, that I get from this video is that uh, actually this young person right in the corner is the last person to speak in the video and they're like, you know, you know, leadership and the teachers, you know, they're doing really good. You know, they're doing land acknowledgements and it's important, you know, to to know how to help communities and to learn about indigenous people. But, you know, they could be doing more. They could be doing better. And and I don't mean that in a negative sense. I think that I think that the fact that these young people are seeing their leaders and their teachers acknowledging indigenous people and they're taking it upon themselves to be critical of it. And upon themselves to think, actually, you could also do this. You could also be doing that. And I think that that's really kind of um, what I hope is sort of the, the snowball of land acknowledgement, right? Is that we're able to kind of get to a critical sort of tipping point and a threshold of, okay, we've heard land acknowledgements. How can we make it better? How can we be critical of it, accept correction, and move forward, right? And I think that, um, that in this work of equity, we just have to be prepared to do that. And uh, these kids, they're, they're such a good example of that because um, it's really easy for young people to, uh, to look at other people and say, yeah, you should be recognized for that. And uh, so it always kind of chokes me up a little bit. <laughs> but they're, uh, they're, yeah, this video is really wonderful. And um, hopefully I'll be able to share that in another, another space. But yeah. Um, so when moving forward, you know, um, I... I think these are a few things that you can kind of ask yourself and uh, and kind of like make sure make sure that you're holding on to you know um, you know learn to accept correct correction without defensiveness you know realize that everyone's on their own journey own journey of identity and healing um, start to map your personal path of reparation and equity expect to make mistakes but do your best and realize that the you know the process of change is ongoing you know. 
Um, and this is a really great resource. Um, you see down there the little website that it's from. Uh, it's from uh, Lucayo, who is a an activist and uh, an organizer, um, a really wonderful artist and teacher. Uh, and they on their website they kind of have a description of sort of where this resource came from. Um, but it's kind of kind of shared as like community knowledge. But I always want to recognize them because they truly kind of mapped out its sort of path to us, you know. So uh, claim being called out or being called in, and this is when when you're being corrected and somebody's calling you out, and how you can really kind of sit with that, sit with that, you know. And uh, so here I'm just going to read this through this, and then we'll we'll kind of move on. But I think it's important. Center yourself. You're not being attacked. You're a good person. This is about your behavior and stopping harm to others. Listen, don't interrupt or think of ways to defend yourself. Focus on learning what was harmful and being empathic slash compassionate. Acknowledge slash apologize. Instead of explaining what you did, acknowledge what happened and apologize if needed or requested for the harm that you caused. Inquire if they consent and have time or resources. Sorry, my window is being hidden from me time or resources uh ask what you could have done instead of making it instead and how to make amends for what happened the best apology is change behavior if they gave you reasonable recommendations amend to make amends do them don't do harm again and use this experience to help others learn too um you know this is a really wonderful resource if you go to this website at the at the bottom you can you can find it um, but it's also pretty uh, widely shared over online, being called out, being called in. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's I think it's a good sort of rule of thumb for everyone, uh, because if you if you sort of expect yourself, you know, to if you sort of expect yourself to to make mistakes, um, but but know that you're trying to move forward, it can kind of set you up for when you're when you are corrected to not immediately have that defensiveness sort of um sort of uh, uh, reaction. Yeah. Yeah, so, okay, we'll go ahead and keep going. More tips. Um, I, I see a couple uh, a couple information or a couple questions that are coming in on, on the, the first questions, but we'll get to those in just one second. Um, and these are just like some tips that I like to share with people that I think are, are helpful. They're helpful to me as, at least. Um, so I like to consent to correction. So when I'm doing a land acknowledgement, you know, of course, unless I, unless I'm, you know, here, here on my lands, um, I, I, I like to say, you know what, I, I just want to consent to correction. If I've misspoke, if I've mispronounced, you know, um, if I've done anything that's offensive or, or incorrect, um, if you have like the, the time and space, you know, please, please correct me, you know, and I like to announce that in my land acknowledgements or in presentations that I'm doing, you know, about the content, um, but specifically about land acknowledgements. And I think that I think that's a good way to sort of set yourself up to even be ready to be corrected, you know, so you can not have that knee jerk reaction that feels like, oh, somebody's correcting you because you're bad or because you've been offensive or because you've done something, you know, um, you know, uh, wrong in the sense that you've hurt people right and it's about sort of setting yourself up to be ready to be corrected uh, i also like to advise people to you know write a letter to the local um, tribal council introducing yourself like i said introductions are important and so many people come to alaska with a different context right and this is you know particularly in alaska but but all but all really indigenous places you know we've we've had people come in and remove us from our own lands remove us from our culture, try to, you know, take things from us. So coming in with your context of why you're there and what you're doing um, can help set up at least maybe the basis for a relationship and allegiance, you know, um, or at least give the tribal council um, the choice in the matter, right? The choice to be in allegiance with you, the choice to be in relationship with you based on what you share in, in a humbleness, you know, um, also, I think it's important to find out the current work being done by the local tribe and how you can support them. You know, every tribe, you know, is working on their own, their own, their own things. You know, my tribe and Chickaloon is very concerned with um, the revitalization of indigenous language, you know, and, and they're very concerned with uh, our school. We have the only tribal school 
you know, in Alaska um, that isn't isn't funded. We fundraise every year for our school, you know, and, and those are those are really easy, you know, kind of plug in ways for you to support us, you know, monetarily. But also spreading that information is a way that you support people. It's important. Um, always offer compensation for labor. You know, I think a lot of times we invite Native people in to do introduct or to do, you know, a, um, a, a land acknowledgement or a blessing, right? Um, and a lot of that is uncompensated. And I think that it's kind of the impression that, oh, well, aren't you happy that we're doing it? And so you should just be doing it for free, you know, and that's, and that's not fair because um, not only is it just labor, it is also emotional labor. So build, you know, this compensation into your budgets and, and, and expect to put it into your planning, you know, um, for every event, um, because every event that you do should include Indigenous people, because particularly on the fish and wildlife, you know, it's like you're managing these, these things that are ours, you know, and that we've cared for for thousands of years, um, you know. Hopefully it's not too offensive, <laughs> but, um, you know, also continue, continue to perspective take, you know, interrogate your own beliefs, you know, think about ways that you might be biased, you know, or that you might be holding on to, you know, a belief that you can't quite shake, you know, and really look at it, examine it, you know, tease out kind of why you feel those things, you know, and, and, and do that work yourself, right? Um, also remember to forgive yourself. We all start somewhere. But once we acknowledge our past, we're responsible for our future, you know, so <laughs> I, you know, for everyone watching, right, it's like you, you're, you're, you have a lot of power and privilege just being here, you know, taking in this information that I'm sharing, right. Um, and again, I, I'm not always right. But at the same time, it's your responsibility to take what you've learned here, even if it's just one sentence that you've learned, you know, one thing that you're pulling apart, it's your responsibility to share that. And to and to and to really perpetuate, you know, um, those things, uh, because that's truly sharing the burden of truth and sharing, you know, sharing, um, sharing, sharing the history and the truth and 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 just the knowledge. And it makes it so it's not only on my shoulders, you know, um, this should be on all of our shoulders, particularly if we want to be allies particularly if we want to be a community. Uh, and if that's what you believe, if, that, if that's something that you want for your community, for yourself, for your work, uh, then that's up to you, you know. Um, share the burden of truth. All right. So now we're going to go back to those. Oh, wait, no, we have a cute, cute little video. Girl in ladybug pajamas. Go. We at Noiji did the best test stories of this lab. The Gaika Wangu people of the War Nation. Past, present, and future. We touch the girl, Gaika Lab. We reach up for the girl, touch the Gaika Lab. And we touch our heart for the Gaika Lab. Yeah, I like to kind of end what I said with that because I know it can be kind of heavy sometimes, but this is what our future looks like if we do this work. And even though it's hard and we have a lot of questions and barriers and fears, we need to do this for our young people. We need to do this for our community um, because they'll feel it like this young person in their body. It's just second nature, easy to say and easy to um, recognize the work of others and, and, and to acknowledge Indigenous people in that. So um, I see questions coming in, which I'm excited about to look at the answers. So we'll go back here. Um, and I'm just going to kind of try to scroll through. Think about where you are. Let's see. I apologize if I can't get to, can't get to everyone. Um, I see people talking about the indigenous people. Oh, here's a question. Um, uh, I got one say saying that I, if I'm afraid if I work too much on reparations, um, of being seen within the agency as being biased or too pro-native. Uh, oh, that's really sad. <laughs> um, uh, pro-native, I think, is just pro-people. <laughs> and uh, and I, I appreciate, though, your bluntness and in, in, in saying it like that, because 
there is kind of this um, perspective in many workplaces, you know, that like, oh, well, if we give it all to Native people or we're bringing in, we're offering too many seats to Native people, then 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 it's unbalanced. Um, but the, e the equity part of this work, equity is not equality. Equality is that everyone has an equal share of it. But equity is about realizing that some people, some groups have have a, an imbalance of power in these spaces. And that right now, if we're trying to change and trying to shift that balance of power to be equal, that we have to be that we have to be bringing in those marginalized communities first and foremost, because eventually we'll start to shift that narrative. We'll start to shift that power structure where it can be equal, you know? And I think that, um, you know, I hope that's not a phrase you've heard being too too pro native because that's really sad if anybody has said that um, uh, because yeah <laughs> for many reasons but yeah so I I think that um, if there's a way that you can kind of share with your organization what equity is and uh, and really kind of what that what that um, what that means it's about shifting power structures and that takes time. You know, I, I sit on many, um, you know, I sit on a public art committee and and uh, we're talking about like the open seats and who it should go to, who should we invite, because it's an invite only kind of thing. And, uh, you know, my my the leader, you know, in in sort of that group, the 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 curator, you know, um, was was I said, well, we should allot the two open seats to indigenous people. And they're like, well, we have you. Right. So. We need to allot it to other groups, you know, or to other like, um, you know, professions, you know, or other other people, you know, and and I and I addressed it with him as being like, well, when you say that, I was like, you're you're looking at indigenous cultures just in Alaska as a monolith, you know, you're looking at us as one people. When you say native, you're saying one people, you know, and the th truth is, <laughs> you know, there's we're all very unique and different. And that we come from different community perspectives, and 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 me just being here is only an Atna perspective because I'm only an Atna person. I'm a Paiute person too, but speaking about Alaska, you know, I'm only an Atna person, and I only represent that. You need to have other groups of Indigenous people represented in that, you know, and that I don't, I can't represent one culture, and and I would say the same for you that 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 you know, whatever sort of work that you're doing with one community doesn't represent all the natives of people, doesn't represent all indigenous Alaska or all indigenous wherever you're you're coming in from. So um yeah, I I would just I would just um try to try to explain equity to those sort of criticisms of being too pro-native and um uh you know good luck and I appreciate the work that you're doing, you know, on reparations. That's so important and it means a lot to native people and to native communities um so thank you um so i got one another one melissa this is crystal i'm wondering Hello. if you can unmute your screen and um have jen maybe moderate the question okay yeah that would be great um let me stop sharing okay. yeah well thank you crystal Thank you, Melissa. That was super informational and we appreciate you sharing from your heart. Um, we do have a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, the first one is, what happens when you have a tribal member who is against land acknowledgement? They view it as a reminder of historic trauma and broken promises and treaties. Crystal and Melissa both nod their heads. Yeah, land acknowledgements can totally be hollow and they can be, they can feel really hurtful, right? Particularly when they are memorized, when they don't come from a personal place, which is why I advise people to do land acknowledgements that come from your personal work, you know, that come from your sort of personal sort of um, understanding, you know, and, and I would, you know, if somebody is expressing that to you, ask them if you can have more of a conversation with them. You know, and 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 maybe pose it as like, well, what ways um, could we acknowledge uh, acknowledge acknowledge those 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 things? You know, 
what if my land acknowledgement was, you know, I'm I'm here on, I'll just use my my term, I'm here on Otna land that is, um, you know, a, uh, that has a, a, a Otna land where the Otna people have experienced broken treaties, they've experienced land displacement, they've experienced genocide, you know, I think sometimes um, those moments, it's about speaking truth to power, right? And I think that land acknowledgements can feel really hollow and harmful when those histories aren't recognized, you know? And again, I, I have to reiterate and say too that everyone is on their own path of healing and identity, you know? And for some, they're still going through that trauma. And for some, they're still holding on to that history you know, because there's been many microaggressions against them, you know, and part of your work to be done because you're trying to be in relationship with Indigenous people, including that person, is about talking to them, asking them, you know, what is what is the appropriate way for me to address these things? If they have time and space and if they consent to that. Yeah, thank you, Melissa. <laughs> I'll add to that too. I um, this reminds me of a question I got um, via email before the broadcast about what is the difference between an individual land acknowledgement and an acknowledgement from a field station point of view. And I think um, it's important to know and remember that as a federal agency, we have a government to government relationship with tribes. So if a field station is going to make a land acknowledgement, like a written land acknowledgement on a permanent display or on a website or in social media, really that land acknowledgement um, should be consulted on with the tribal government that's nearest to you um, or whose traditional homelands um, the field station is located on. It, it's, a different, it's a different level of relationship it's a really high level relationship that requires um, maybe uncovering some uncomfortable truths from history and acknowledging those truths and repairing through healing and conversation. And then the tribal council really is the authority of the tribe. Um, so you can, again, what Melissa said is spot on, have individual conversations with the tribal member. Um, but it's it's a different relationship if you're talking about a field station having a land acknowledgement. Absolutely. I, I also want to add to that as well, like the difference between personal and institutional land acknowledgements, right? Um, I think like institutional land acknowledgements, uh, it needs to be done in a group and it needs to be done in a way that, again, is consulting with, with individuals, right? Because those things come out of being like, well, we want your station to acknowledge this, right? And I, I also think that there's um, a way to, to sort of turn it into a living document and maybe announce, or at least within that group, recognize that, um, that this is going to be changing, you know, as our as our communities and our knowledge changes, right? So today, this is what our land acknowledgement is, and that we've we've been informed and and have been in agreement and in an equitable, you know, relationship with the indigenous people. Um, but tomorrow it might be different because they ask us to change it, and you have to be ready to make that change and ready to adjust, um, because that's part of the relationship. You know, it's part of not sort of reaching a land acknowledgement, you know, for your institution that is perfect, right? Um, because I don't think there really is a perfect one. It's all should be changing as your knowledge changes and shifts. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you for that. We have time for one more quick question um, before we need to wrap up for today. This has been super informative, um, but the question just came in should the federal government be compensating tribes for consultation? Absolutely. <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, I <laughs> yeah, yes. I mean, um, they should be compensating them for consulting work. 
You know, it may be a government to government relationship, but it's also an, an equitable relationship. And that's something we have to recognize what the power structures are. And then also, um, just like you would consult a, a scientist or a biologist to, you know, take a take samples for something, you know, to, to work on your management, just like you consult with outside firms, you know, outside researchers and academics, um, you're consulting with people, you know, and it's not this sort of like ethereal thing. Tribes, people, they all need to be compensated for their time and work. Yeah, I'll, and I'll add, I, I know that we have um, our Department of Interior Tribal Consultation Policies and Fish and Wildlife Service guidance through our Native American policy. They don't talk about um, compensation, uh, that it touches on it a bit, but what Melissa is talking about is when, when tribal uh, experts, elders, um, or hunters, gatherers, people who have um, traditional knowledge are providing that knowledge to us, it's like we are paying a scientific researcher for the time they're spending research, their, their lab time, um, all, all the kinds of uh, travel and data gathering that they've done. And so it is important that we, if we're, if we're getting knowledge for our purposes, that we do compensate them for that. You know, and I, I just think it's kind of an important thing to say too, that, you know, indigenous people with whatever sort of knowledge that they have, every person is not born with that knowledge. You're not born knowing these things. You're not born knowing how to care for the land, to understand these sort of deep knowledge things. They're hard won and they are incredibly researched, incredibly, you know, um, uh, resilient in, in keeping that and, and being able to do that alongside also the Western education, you know, that we're, that we're you know, our, our history and our knowledge is, is all self-education and it's all been a lot of work for indigenous people to do on them, their own. So everyone you're talking to um, did not have a privilege. They had to really work for that. And that's what you're paying for. You're paying for their hard won and hard kept knowledge. Thank you. Thank you both Crystal and Melissa for sharing your knowledge with us today. We really appreciate your time. Um, as a reminder, NCTC will continue hosting the tribal broadcast series on the third Thursday of each month. And we'll have a follow up to this broadcast. Um, it's called Growing from Land Acknowledgements, which will be held on Thursday, October 21st at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. Each broadcast is recorded and available on NCTC's website. If you wish to learn more about future broadcasts or be added to the listserv, please email me. It's Jennifer Hill at Jennifer underscore Hill at FWS.gov. And I want to thank everybody for joining us today and remind folks that if you need further information from Crystal or Melissa, their contact information is on the screen as well as a link to the Region 5, Legacy Region 5 SharePoint site, which has information about land acknowledgements. And we just, again, want to give our deepest thanks to Crystal and Melissa for their time today. So thank you all for joining. Yeah, Chit Chinan, everyone. I really appreciate people listening in. Kleana. Credits. Tribal Connections Roundtable Team, Doug Canfield, Rob Garfinkel, Melissa Gonzalez, Alexandria Henry, Johnny McEachin, Rhonda Miller, Randy Robinson, thanks to our guests, Crystal Leonetti, Melissa Shaganoff. Semicolon Music, Tribal Spirit slash Neil Cross slash Audio Blocks, Music and Video, Audio Blocks, Video Blocks, Warner Chapel, Text, Thank you for joining today's broadcast. Seals for the U.S. Department of the Interior and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Field of hay-colored grass beneath a blue sky with wispy white clouds. A line of mountains in the far distance.